Okay, thanks very much for your attendance. And we're going to get the show on the road. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Suzanne Fortier, who's McGill's principal and vice chancellor, and has filled that job admirably since, uh, for 20, since 2013 since 2013. Uh, before coming to McGill, uh, she was uh, head of NSERC, which is a Canadian uh, organization that some of you students may, may know for science and engineering. And uh, it is probably the most prestigious position to head that uh, in Canada. So please, uh, let's welcome P Professor Fortier McGill, principal. <laughs> Bonsoir et bienvenue à vous tous. C'est vraiment merveilleux de voir cette belle salle remplie à craquer. There's not an empty seat. In fact, I was worried about getting up and coming to the podium because I thought, surely somebody will see there's an empty seat there. <laughs> so you're welcome to my seat. I'm going to be here, though, for the whole evening. Uh, as you know, the Trottier uh, Public Science Symposium is an event that takes place every year. And I want to uh, acknowledge today the great contribution from Lauren Trotti and the Trotti Family Foundation. That's why we're here. So merci beaucoup. And of course, I want to also thank the McGill Office for Science and Society. They're the folks who organize these great symposium for us every year. So you know that the event is taking place over two days, and I suggest you come both days, because you have treats every night for this uh, year uh, symposium. As you know, the uh, purpose of the symposium is to share knowledge about science, to talk about various uh, topics of science, to develop our critical sense, because as of course we all know, there's a lot of stuff that we see on the web in the media, and we often wonder, is it true or is it just nonsense? And part of uh, the things that we all like to do is find out the truth and, find, and get uh, more knowledge about science. And we want to have this presented to us in a way that is accessible, and this is very much behind these symposium. I don't know if you've taken the time to look at the topics over the year, but I have to say that I have and they're all fascinating. So around the summertime, I start thinking, what will they do this year? And I must say, I think this year they really uh, have chosen a fantastic topic, longing for longevity, something that we all, I think, are wanting. But we want to live a long life, but we don't want to get old. So here's the problem. I don't know, some of you have enjoyed longevity. Might remember a song, I remember it when I was a young woman, a song by a very uh, interesting English uh, young woman called Petula Clark. Tout le monde veut aller au ciel, mais personne ne veut mourir. It was a big, big hit in this province, and I think she summarized very much the feeling of everybody, which is we want to live a long life, and we'd like to live it feeling young. And I think this is what we're going to hear about throughout uh, those two days from fantastic speakers who've agreed to be with us to make this symposium a really wonderful an event where that we will learn a lot. So again, thank you to the family, the Trotti uh, Family Foundation, and to uh, Joe and his, uh, his team at the McGill Office for Science and so Society. And now I'll invite Joe to come back and say a few words about this year's event. Thank you very much. As you heard over the years, we organized uh, many such events, and uh, they've all gone smoothly, but sometimes you run into a little hurdle, as we have tonight, because one of our speakers, uh, Kelly Dobos, unfortunately had a medical emergency and cannot join us, but 
I have found an alternate speaker. Uh, I've dabbled in cosmetics over the years, so <laughs> I will try to do my best to fill in. We are indeed longing for longevity, and um, aging is not an attractive proposition. And we would certainly love to slow down that clock, and if possible, even turn it back. We're out there searching for the fountain of youth. Where is it to be found? Where is that next exit? Believe it or not, it is in St. Augustine, Florida. <laughs> Florida, that hotbed of youth. <laughs> but it is there that you will literally find the fountain of youth. Interesting history there. It is dedicated to a Spanish explorer by the name of Ponce de Leon. And I'm sure many of you have heard the legend that when he was governor of Puerto Rico, he heard a story that there was a fountain of youth in Florida, and he went searching for it. Well, he searched and searched, looked all over the place, but did not find it. What he did find, though, was the tip of an arrow from a native, and uh, he died from that wound, age of 47. But the state of Florida has decided that this would be a great tourist attraction to sort of reincarnate the supposed fountain of youth, and it is there, and you can go and drink from that fountain as hundreds of thousands of people go and visit there. But maybe the most interesting part of this story is that Ponce de Leon's story is a total myth. He never searched for the fountain of youth. Stories about that came much, much after he died. But it's such an interesting story that it gets retold and retold. And to this day, people, of course, are searching for various types of waters that supposedly will rejuvenate. And there are all kinds. You can go out there and buy alkaline water. Uh, Professor Fortier talked about sense and nonsense. Well, here's an example of nonsense. Uh, the human body cannot change the level of acidity of its blood depending on the kind of water you drink. Our blood is a buffered system, does not change its, its pH. But there are plenty of people out there who will tell you that drinking alkaline water is the key to health. And if not that, well, then you can drink double helix water. Uh, it is good for absolutely everything. It's a cure-all, but it's rather expensive. Or you can make your own magic rejuvenating water. Here it is, and all you need is that little disc that you see sitting under the glass. And if you look at the pictures that come with the brochure, you see that it not only purifies the water, uh, it can realign your chakras, and I'm sure all of us have some chakras out of alignment, uh, so we need to uh, realign those. There's all kinds of magical things. And what is this wonder product? There it is. It's a little plastic disc. If you turn it over, they have a picture of Nikola Tesla on there for no apparent reason whatsoever, and they will tell you that this is really the secret to youth because it energizes you, it invigorates your uh, body's chakras, it does everything that is needed in order for us to stay young. But I think anyone with the most modicum of scientific knowledge will understand that this is total quackery. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. It isn't really difficult these days to find water quackery. I found it here, I ordered this gizmo. Uh, this will hydrogenate your water. Uh, you fill it with water, you plug it in, and it puts hydrogen into the water. And as you can see by the extensive explanation here, uh, I will tell you that hydrogen is really the key to life. What they fail to tell you, that hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, is essentially insoluble in water. So no matter how much of it you generate in this electrolysis gizmo, not going to do anything. But of course, you still have to put it to an experiment. Maybe we're wrong about that. So I did put it to the experiment. I, I tried it. And I can tell you that it was very disappointing. It did nothing for me. So I thought that maybe 
I was looking at the wrong water here, and I needed some expertise. So who do you consult these days when you want health expertise? Well, of course, you turn to Goop and Gwyneth Paltrow, because who better than a former actress to know everything about how the body works? And what does she recommend? She recommends water that has been infused with crystal energy. So you can buy this contraption, which as you can see has a very pretty crystal in it, and you fill it with water, and uh, the water absorbs the energy of the crystal. Crystals, of course, have no energy. Uh, and then you can go ahead and, uh, and drink this one as well, and uh, I would say that it is equally disappointing. <laughs> but you know what, maybe I've been drinking the wrong thing. Maybe I shouldn't look for youth in water, maybe it should be in wine. Uh, because you have heard all the stories about this supposedly magical chemical called resveratrol, which has been found in red wine. Well, you will hear some more about this a bit later today. And um, I, I think the story that you will hear is not exactly the one that uh, the press has uh, uh, spread out. But uh, uh, you will hear uh, a very interesting insight uh, into this from Dr. David Sinclair, who I will introduce a, a little bit uh, later. And uh, he will uh, also tell you that this wine thing is really a myth. But he has gone way beyond that. And he will tell you about some fascinating molecules that he is working on, which are not myth and which have uh, extensive animal uh, research behind them and some human clinical trials uh, that demonstrate that it is in fact possible to increase our longevity. But let's just turn for a few minutes to the interesting area of cosmetics. Uh, Dr. Sinclair will tell you about what you can do to the inside of your body. I'll take a few minutes here to tell you what can be done to the outside. Because, of course, it is a very attractive proposition that we can use various kinds of cosmetics in order to turn back the clock and give us back our youthful look. So we look into the mirror, and uh, sometimes you don't recognize who is in there. I'm finding that. You know, I look into the mirror every morning. I say, who is that? You know. uh, so you look into the mirror, and... Uh, you wonder, wonder, what should I do to make myself look pretty? <laughs> well, there are things that we can do. If you look at this lady, you probably don't recognize her. Uh, yeah, I see some faces there who show some appreciation for this. Let me put some makeup on her. And then, of course, you will recognize her, and that's Marilyn Monroe. So obviously, makeup can do a lot. But these days, when you look into that mirror, what comes up are worries. Worries about sulfates in your cosmetics. Worries about parabens. Parabens is a preservative that I'm sure many of you have heard about, mostly because so many cosmetics have a logo on them that says no parabens. I worry about those cosmetics because I'm not particularly partial to bacteria on the skin. And uh, the reason that preservatives are put into cosmetics is because they are necessary. Just think, when you put your finger into that cream and you put it on your face, next time you put your finger back into that cream, you've contaminated it. And it's a great environment for bacterial growth. You have moisture and you have fatty substances. So you do need the preservative. Then, of course, there are all kinds of other ingredients that you may not recognize because of the, uh, of the chemical names. And many people are scared of these because they've seen books like this. Toxic beauty, there's lead in your lipstick. Well, yeah, there may be some lead in your lipstick, but the question to ask is how much lead? And when you find out that it's a few parts per trillion, then you realize that that probably isn't anything to worry about because most people do not dine on their lipstick. And we've done some calculations, and it turns out that you'd have to eat about five lipsticks every day in order to reach a level of lead that would be uh, an issue. Numbers matter. A part per trillion is the width of a credit card in the distance between the Earth and the moon. We can now find that, at least my analytical chemist colleagues can find that, and they're the root of all our problems because they're getting so good at finding something everywhere that 
pretty well we'll find everything is contaminated by everything else. So numbers matter in science. In terms of cosmetics, the history is really quite fascinating. It goes back a long, long time. As undoubtedly you know, the ancient Egyptians were very fond of cosmetics. And if you ever have the chance to visit the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, you will see something quite stunning, which is the statue of Queen Nefertiti. 1300 BC is when that was made. You look at this, it looks like it was made yesterday. They were amazing. And for any of you who have not yet seen the exhibit here in Montreal at the museum about the mummy exhibit from, from uh, the British Museum, do not miss this. It's really something special. Anyway, uh, scientists have looked at busts of Queen Nefertiti and have recreated what she may have looked like. And she was quite stunning, a lot of cosmetics. What kind of cosmetics? Well, for example, on her eyebrows, it was lead sulfide. Of course, they knew nothing at those days about toxicity. Uh, what did they use for lipstick? Well, it could have been either iron oxide, which is just rust, and whenever you see brown soil like that, what you're looking at is, is iron oxide. That's pretty innocuous. But they also used mercury sulfide or cinnabar to color their lipstick. That's not a good idea, because a small am amount of mercury goes a long way. Uh, they may have used the Kermes insect, and this insect produces a red dye. You squeeze it, and it can be formulated into lipstick. And today, the same technology is, in fact, still used. If you ever look at the list of ingredients on your cosmetic, on your lipstick, you'll find that Generally, the main ingredient is castor oil and, and some sort of wax, like carnauba wax or candela wax. Then you have isopropyl myristate, which is an emulsifier. This prevents moisture and fat from separating, so you get a nice consistency. And cholesterol does the same thing. Cholesterol is actually an emulsifier as well. But again, most people do not make a habit of eating the lipstick, so the amount of cholesterol in there is, is irrelevant. You have BHT or BHA, those are preservatives because you are always transferring bacteria to the lipstick. And then you have the ingredient that I just mentioned, which is carmine, and this is an insect ex uh, extract. This time, it's not the Kermes insect, it's the cochineal. And uh, this is a fascinating little insect. It lives on cacti, uh, mostly in Mexico, and uh, they're very small, and when you squeeze the bug, and it's only the female that produces the dye, but unfortunately the male is squashed together with the female. He's sacrificed because of the f beauty of the female. And the red dye then is used for uh, lipstick. It is generally very safe. It is potentially allergenic, but it's rare. Although there's one interesting case that I know of that I was consulted on when uh, a little boy, every Friday night, came home from school with a red splotch on his cheek, like eczema, but, but red. And they couldn't figure out what this was. And then eventually, uh, after a lot of questioning, turned out that his grandmother picked him up from school every Friday, and she kissed him on the cheek. And the boy was allergic to cochineal red. So it happens, but it's rare. Way back in the second century AD, Galen, the Roman physician concocted the first, what we would call commercial cosmetic, which was a cream called Galen's Cold Cream. And it was made of olive oil or almond oil, rose water, and beeswax. And the whole idea here was to put it on the skin and prevent moisture in the skin from evaporating. That's what moisturizing creams do. It's not the moisture in the cream that does anything. It is the fact that you're providing a, a lipophilic barrier that is a fatty barrier on the skin through which moisture cannot evaporate. Well, since that time, we have come quite a long way. And the chemistry of cosmetics is, is absolutely fascinating. It's a very specialized area of, of chemistry. And of course, what we're interested in here is, is rejuvenation, turning back the clock. We know that we don't want to look like that. And we wish that there were some kind of magic that we could apply that would cause reversal, like this. Well, as you suspect, doesn't exist. But there is something that one can do to prevent 
what is called photoaging, aging of the skin. And that is to reduce exposure to the sun. And the more efficient you are at doing that, the less chance that you're going to see photoaging and, of course, reduce the risk of skin cancer and, of course, should be using sunscreen. Uh, you have probably heard stories about how some ingredients like oxybenzone and sunscreen uh, may be endocrine disruptors. Well, yeah, if you use them in a high dose in some cell culture, they may show some activity like that, but nothing has ever been shown in humans. And although you have heard stories about this damaging uh, the coral reefs, again, there's no evidence that it does that. But there's plenty of evidence that it can protect the skin and reduce the incidence of skin cancer. Now back to Galen's cold cream, which is a very simple concoction. But you know what? The creams that are being manufactured today are essentially the same. This is a very good product. I don't get anything from promoting it. It's very cheap. Pond's cold cream, and the reason these are called cold creams, because the moisture in the cream evaporates, and when water evaporates from the skin, it has to take heat from somewhere to change from a liquid into a vapor. It takes it from the skin. And if you take a look at the ingredients, because now at least we have to have ingredients listed on cosmetics. That's been a big step forward, so that at least if you know you're allergic to something, you can stay away. But you take a look, and you see that the first ingredients are mineral oil and water, the same as in Galen's cream. That's, the, that's the, the magic behind it. Now, we do have some better emulsifiers so that you get a smoother cream. You get some texturizing agent. And of course, we also have some preservatives so that you don't uh, suffer any kind of uh, uh, bacterial infection. There are various kind of medicinal ingredients also that can be used. One that you've probably heard about is alpha hydroxy acids and as a face cream. And this actually does work. Uh, what it does do is causes a rapid turnover of cells on the surface of the skin. And it does have a rejuvenating effect. But again, in science, numbers matter. And you have to have at least 8% alpha hydroxy acid in the cream for it to be effective. But the one that probably is the most effective is Retin-A. Uh, Retin-A was developed by a dermatologist by the name of Albert Kligman, who is sort of the god of dermatology. And uh, I remember once going to a dermatological conference where he was there and people virtually genuflected in front of him uh, because of uh, the invention of, of Retin-A. And uh, Retin-A uh, is a prescription product. Uh, it's a cream, and it really can reduce uh, wrinkles. And then, of course, uh, obviously, you have Botox, but that's not, uh, not a topical uh, product. And then we also have retinal palmitate. You find this in a number of creams. It isn't quite as good as, as uh, retinoic acid, but, but it's sort of a, a close second. And it actually has some science behind it. That's what we always look for. What is the scientific evidence? Well, this time, it is in the British Journal of Dermatology which is a highly respected peer-reviewed journal. And they have published pictorial evidence about this particular product, uh, number seven. And here is the evidence that they publish. Here is the picture before, and here is the picture after. There is a difference, but it's not a whole lot. You take out a magnifying glass, and you look, and you'll find a difference. So that's publishable, because it is statistically significant. But there's a big difference between statistical significance and practical significance. I don't think that if you use this product and you go into a room, anyone is going to see that there's been a dramatic change. And furthermore, when you read the paper, you find that only about one in five showed the results. So it's not all that impressive, but it's publishable, because at least there is a difference. The cosmetic industry is based on always having to come out with some new marketing idea, because what they are really selling is hope in a jar. And uh, there's a lot of hype. Uh, with this, and there are various special ingredients. And the more esoteric these are, often the better they sell. For example, snail slime. <laughs> yes, snail slime. A snail repair cream, anti-wrinkle cream is sold, and uh, they will tell you that the snails secrete the substance and how good it is for the skin, how it contains all kinds of emollients. Well, I mean, I, I've never had snails run over my face, so I, I can't testify to whether it, it works or not. Uh, I think snails are better served like that. Uh, but 
There is really no evidence, but nevertheless, the product sells. Or this one here, Oro Gold. Uh, it's a cream that has tiny little particles of gold in it. Well, gold actually is very malleable, so it can be stretched into a very thin sheet and then cut up. So the amount of gold in there is not much. Uh, they charge enough for it, and the idea is that somehow this is particularly adept at scrubbing the surface of the face. There's just no evidence for this at all. But finally, there's this. Uh, it's a La Prairie product. It's uh, one of the most expensive creams that you can buy, and you can see it comes in a diamond-shaped jar. And uh, there's the price. It's actually, it's a very small jar. It's 1.7 uh, ounces. And uh, they will tell you, uh, the most precious metal on earth now approved, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they tell you about uh, uh, platinum and how wonderful platinum is and how rare it is, which is all true, but what does that have to do with the cream? And uh, I actually uh, tried to confront the company on this one. I called them up and uh, said, how can you do this? You know, I finally did get to speak to someone who, who was involved in the chemistry. So how can you in good conscience do this, sell this for that much money when you don't have any clinical evidence? And he, he said, uh, sir, I'll be honest with you. He says, we do it because we can. And that's, a lot of cosmetic marketing comes down to that. But then he did give me a paper, which supposedly showed something. And here was the paper. It was the effect of some of these compounds that they have in there, these uh, platinum nanoparticles on the lifespan of nematodes. These are worms. So there was some sort of uh, effect on the worm. What did that have to do uh, with uh, cosmetic? Absolutely nothing, but it's highly marketable. So there's a little bit of a view for you uh, inside this very interesting world of, uh, of cosmetics. But we will now switch gears. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair comes to us from Harvard University. He's a professor of genetics. And he has a very large research group at, at uh, Harvard. Uh, he has made a name for himself around the world for doing research on a type of gene called the sirtuin gene. He will tell you all about this. And the potential of this is, is dramatic. Uh, because for the first time, we have some real scientific evidence that there is something that can be done uh, for aging. This is not unsubstantiated hype. Uh, this is solid science. It is peer reviewed. And uh, it is going to be something that you will hear a great deal about uh, in the next few years. So I'd like to welcome Professor Sinclair to McGill and uh, ask him to take over and regale you with uh, tales of uh, what promises to be perhaps the real fountain of youth. Thank you. When you finish, just sit down and get part there. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schwartz, I think. Uh, usually, I spend uh, quite a while trying to convince a crowd that what I'm talking about isn't a bunch of BS. But uh, now, I, now I have to try extra hard. Uh, let me just call up my talk here. Um, OK, well, we're good. So before I talk about uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, I do want to say some thanks. I would like to say thanks to everybody who uh, decided to invite me. Uh, I'm sure uh, Lauren and Louise Trottier had a, a say. And I want to thank you for not just tonight, but for you know being very generous about informing the world about what, what's fact and what isn't fact, because we live in a world that is increasingly hard to distinguish between those two. So uh, can I just have everyone thank them again, because it's really important. Um, okay. And this is very personal to me, because I'm, uh, I'm faced with this problem every day. If you were to uh, type in my name into the internet, you wouldn't most likely find my book, or you wouldn't most likely find my research. You'd most likely find products uh, sold by people who I have nothing to do with, who are using made-up quotes from me uh, with my name all over the internet. 
And I cannot tell you how much money I've spent trying to stop that, and it's impossible to stop it. There's even a company called Sinclair uh, Labs that sells products based on my lab's research. Um, and I just found out tonight there's another copy of my book, uh, a, a pseudo, pseudo book. Uh, there was one on the internet. So my book is called, it's called Lifespan. Um, and this was 10 years of work into this book. And I poured everything I had into it. Uh, and within a few days of being on Amazon, um, now first of all, I was very lucky it, it shot up to a, being a New York Times bestseller. So that was great. And then I'm looking online to see how the reviews are looking. And I see that there's a book that looks great. It's getting some good reviews. Um, and it's written by Daniel Sinclair. And it's a ripoff of what I've written. And there are people writing to me saying, how do you, I can't, I can't uh, this book sucks. I've gotten this uh, copy. Um, and then I learned tonight there's another one uh, out there. So please look for the book that has my name on it and is it actually a PhD. That would be good. Um, I will be writing to uh, uh, Mr. Bezos actually after this to tell him to, to help me uh, shut down these things. But we live in a world where it's very easy now to rip things off and take people for a ride. Um, and we see that not just on the internet, but we see it um, in cosmetics. We see it also in, in other parts of the world, in drugs as well. You can't even trust what you're going to get. And I cannot, well, I can tell you, and I'm going to tell you, I, w I wake up every morning to uh, more than a few hundred messages and questions from people saying, asking me, Dr. Sinclair, what can I trust? Um, and I, I just can't. I could spend my whole day replying to all of them. Um, but tonight, I'm going to tell you about some of what I think you can trust, um, and that's the science. Uh, and all my disclaimers down there, uh, I work with biotech companies. I've started <clears throat> 15 of them. <clears throat> I have no affiliation to supplement companies. So everything I'm going to tell you about products that are out there, um, I have nothing to gain, as uh, Dr. Schwartz also said. OK. Uh, so these are two people near and dear to me. <clears throat> uh, the lady on, my, on the left is my grandmother, and she is uh, a lady who raised me when I was young. She gave birth to the person on the right, uh, who is my father, obviously, um, when she was 15. Uh, it was a bit of a, a scandal back in uh, the 1930s, uh, 1939. And, uh, and so I... I had a very young grandmother, and she taught me that having lived through World War II and the aftermath in Hungary, that humans are capable of great bad. And we are going to hear uh, Dr. Ruth Westheimer about, uh, talk about that. Um, she understands that better than I do. But also, uh, she also realized that, that children are innocent, and they're the ones that you should, should trust. And so she told me to, to stay young. She told me six was the best age. Now, and she used to read A.A. A. Milne uh, all the time uh, to me. And there is a, 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 a stanza in uh, Winnie the Pooh that says, uh, now we are six. It's, you know, I'm going to stay uh, six forever and ever. Now, I, I cannot stay six forever and ever, nor can you. Um, but could we one day go back to being 56 or 46? or even 26, uh, I'm going to tell you today that that's not out of the realm of physics, nor is it out of the realm of biology. Another reason I want to show you this slide um, is that my grandmother, Vera, um, she didn't like to be called grandmother or nana. She just wants to be called by her first name, which was radical in the 1970s. Um, she told me that uh, she didn't ever want to grow old, but I saw that happen to her. And we've all had people in our family who have spent the last decade or so of their lives in a state that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. And that's what happened to her. Um, and it went, she went from being the most vivacious, funny, uh, outrageous, rebellious person. She was kicked off Bondi Beach for wearing a bikini in the 50s. She went and lived in New Guinea for two years as a woman in the 1960s. Uh, she went from that to somebody who just gave up on life, didn't go out of the house for 10 years or more and said, David, that's just the way it goes. And I refuse to believe that that's the way it goes. We've never, as a species, said that's the way it goes. We didn't say that about infections. We didn't say it about cancer. And we shouldn't say it about aging either. So she had a terrible end to her life. And this is fairly typical, the way we do medicine these days. Uh, we treat one disease at a time, but we don't fully treat the whole body. 
And for many people, their heart keeps beating, but their brain doesn't, does not do well. And what I'm hoping to do with my research and with my colleagues is to keep the whole body young, not by creating a miracle pill, as Dr. Schwartz has told you, some people claim there is one, but by learning how does the body fight disease? How is it that there are species that live for 200 and 300 and 1,000 years? How do they do it? Some of those animals are very closely related to us, such as the bowhead whale. And if they can have a workaround to aging, so can we. And my hope is that my father and my generation and certainly our children and their children's children will live lives that are very different to us, the way we look at people who grew up in the late 1800s, early 20th century, where it was common to die from childbirth or in an infection from a splinter, and there's no way we'd all go back and live in those days. Okay, so this is my picture of aging. Um, this person, I'm told, is from Australia, where I'm from, where we're all beaten down by the sun. Clearly, this person has had more sun on one side of their face than the other. Uh, but this is, this is the face of aging. Uh, this is what happens. But this is, doesn't just happen to the skin. It happens to all parts of the body. And the question is, why? And this is such a simple question, but I have to say it again. Why do we age? Has, does anyone spend much time thinking about that? I know a lot of researchers don't, and I certainly know a lot of doctors don't, um, but I've thought about this since my grandmother told me she was gonna die one day, um, and so would all my friends and family and myself. So that's sh a shock that we all go through when we're about four or five, but we forget about it. We actually have a part of our brain that helps us forget about that because it's too tragic. And often we think about it and, until it's much too late. Um, but I'm gonna tell you tonight that if you think about it, and you take action, there are things that you can do right now that actually, we believe, can delay aging and help you reach the age um, where Dr. Ruth, she's 91 and as fit as a, a fiddle. I want that for everybody in the world. I don't want us to all live to 200, that's not the goal. It's to be healthy until much later. And if we have a world like that, it'll be a much better place the same way anyone from the 1800s would, would look at today um, and this would be utopia to them. Now we can talk about all the issues that we'll have to overcome society-wise, society but actually the, the savings are in the tens of trillions of dollars globally, and that's money that I think can solve any problem. All right, so speaking of pseudoscience, we, we went through the 1970s, 1980s, and we were still, we still had a, had a hangover from the Manhattan Project where we believe that DNA damage and radiation was the biggest problem, and mutations in our body. And I think if most of us go to a party and somebody starts talking about aging, they will say, DNA damage causes aging, or mutations cause aging, and, uh, and you need to drink a lot of antioxidants. Drink POM Wonderful and you'll be good. Um, I have some bad news for all of you. Even though there's $200 billion spent on antioxidants a year uh, in North America, in drinks and food, uh, I don't think they do a lot. I'm sorry to say, the science doesn't back that up. Now, they're not useless, they will do some good, but they're not going to make you live longer. They've had a huge failure over the last 30, 40 years of uh, tests in terms of slowing down aging. So if that's true, what are we gonna do? Well, over the last 10 years or so, scientists like myself have come up with a list of what we think are the main causes of aging. And we call these the hallmarks of aging. And you've probably heard of some of these, they're in the news, telomere shortening, the ends of chromosomes, mitochondria, the energy packs die out. Uh, we have senescent cells, which are zombie cells that accumulate. Uh, we have diabetes, deregulated nutrient sensing. We have a loss of stem cells, there's a lot of people trying to replace stem cells. And we have um, what's called epigenetic alterations. And this is great, about 10 years ago, we said, as a field, we finished, Eureka. It's a beautiful diagram. Are we done now? We've figured out aging. Um, but I wasn't satisfied because that doesn't explain, that beautiful wheel doesn't explain why they occur in the first place. And just saying bad stuff happens is not a good enough explanation. In the same way that we say, oh, things drop to the floor, that's how it's always been, but you still need to explain why they drop to the floor. And so we do believe that if we address each one of those eight or so hallmarks of aging, we will be 
be healthier and live longer, no question. But we're still building eight dams on eight tributaries. Is there an upstream cause of most, if not all of them? And I believe that there is. Now, scientific uh, paradigm shifts come, come around once every decade or so. And we're in one of those right now in the aging field. Many of my colleagues have tried to test this theory of mutation causing aging, the mutation theory of aging. And what they found is that if you mutate an animal, it can live a normal lifespan. We, we, we've had mice in the lab that have huge amounts of mutations in their nucleus, in their chromosomes. They don't age. That's weird, right, if that theory is true. Uh, the other issue is that if you look in our bodies, there's surprisingly few mutations. Now, you can find them, of course. They're there. And the more sun damage you get and the more exposure to a variety of toxins, you'll have more. But they're just not in the abundance that you would expect if this was the primary driver of aging. So we're going through this paradigm shift. And this always happens when experiment doesn't match theory. And it's a very tough time for scientists because there's a lot of fighting, there's uncertainty. It's a period of chaos. The models drift. We try to move the models to fit the, the data. But then eventually we come up with a new theory that can explain all of this new data and all of the past few hundred years of research. And so what I'm going to propose to you tonight is what I think is the main driver of aging, why we don't stay young forever. And I want to, it can be put the following way. Aging is simply a loss of information. Okay. So we live in an information age. So we know a lot about information loss. We have information loss when we send out radio signals. We have a lot of noise. You can hear it as static. So what kind of information am I talking about here in our bodies? Well, the one we always hear about is the genetic information. This is, of course, what we inherit from our parents. It's the DNA. It's our digital information. And instead of being zeros and ones, it's A, T, C, G, encoded as DNA. And digital information is really robust. That's why it's been the go-to molecule for life for the past four billion years. I was shocked when I first got to the lab and found that you could boil DNA and it, was, it would survive. I thought this would be the most fragile molecule of, of all. And in fact, we can now pull it out of fossils and preserved remains many, many, uh, at least tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years old. So digital information in the form of DNA is very robust. And as I've mentioned to you, it seems to last a lot longer than we thought, even within our lifetimes. So if it's not DNA, what is it? So the other type of information that's just as important, and without it, we would be dead in seconds, is epigenetic information. And what I mean by epigenetic information is how the cell controls its genome. It, so the DNA in our bodies is not just flailing around like it's a, a piece of string in a swimming pool. It has to be regulated very precisely. The reason is that every cell has a different function, or at least group, every cell is part of a tissue that have very specific functions. The brain cells, there are hundreds of types in our brain. Each type has to have its own identity, very different from a skin cell or a liver cell but they all have the same DNA. So what makes them different is how their DNA is packaged. And DNA that's wrapped up very tightly, like you would spool a hose on a driveway, that's chromatin, we call it chromatin that's off, and genes that need to be switched on, nerve-specific genes in the brain, are looped out, spooled out in these big loops so the cell can now read them and make proteins out of it. And that information, unfortunately, is predominantly analog information. And I think most of us here are old enough to know how much analog information sucks. Anyone who's had a cassette player or a record player, or as uh, Joe Biden would say, a phonograph, we know that these things are really bad at storing information long term. In fact, if you try to play an old cassette tape, it's probably not going to play too well, let alone if you've scratched a record. And even a CD player, a CD will get scratched as well. You know, I have to teach medical students at Harvard Medical School and explain to them these days what a CD is. 
I have to say that it's this thing we used to put music on it. It could hold up to 10 songs. It was incredible. Uh, so the, the fact that the epigenome is analog, and the reason it's analog, by the way, is that it needs to be. It needs to respond very quickly to the environment. It's what changes when you eat a meal. It's what changes when you get hit by damage. Say you have an x-ray and you damage your DNA. It's the epigenome that responds and changes how the genes are switched on and off. But the important part of aging is that once a cell responds to a threat and starts changing the way genes are turned on and off, I believe it doesn't always reset its original state. And over time, we lose our epigenetic information. Those green things, by the way, we call those histones. Those are proteins that are very useful for bundling up the DNA. And if you pulled out a piece of DNA from the cell, it'd be about six feet long. Uh, and, but those histones would be a lot like holiday lights strung along. And they're actually largely what controls which genes are on and off. Now, there's another modification that changes genes on and off, and it's called DNA methylation. And Dr. Schwartz wouldn't tell you as a chemist that a methyl is just a hydrogen with three car uh, carbon with three hydrogens on there. And what we found out is that these methyls, they don't just control what type of cell a cell will be, but they also accumulate in specific ways as we get older, which will be important in a moment. But when I talk about epigenetic noise, not noise from a radio signal, but true epigenetic noise, what I'm talking about is a cell that starts out beautifully young, functioning 100% when we're born, usually, and even as we're teenagers, things work pretty well, but over time we're still aging. And what's changing is the organization of our DNA, the analog part of our genomes. And so in this diagram, you can see that genes that were once on, this red dot here with the uh, RNA coming out, that's a gene that's on. It may eventually be shut off over time by accident and vice versa. And those methyl chemical groups will start to get messed up over time. And we can read that. And we can actually tell you how old you are by reading those changes with those chemicals on the DNA. It's called the epigenetic clock. And what's scary about that, and I need to give a shout out to my colleague Steve Horvath at UCLA who helped develop this clock. I could take a blood sample from each of you and very precisely predict when you're going to die. It's that accurate. And if you smoke, and if you don't exercise, and if you eat three full big meals a day, your clock will go faster. We now know that. But there, there's some good news. I'll get to that in a minute. But the best analogy uh, I can give you tonight is that our cells are like compact disks that get scratched. The information is still there, but the cell doesn't read that information. So what we've been looking for is the polish. How do you get back the information? The other way to think of it is that our, our epigenome is the software of our computer. And then the third way, one that uh, people are telling me from in, in the book they like it, is that our genome is the piano, but instead of having you know, the normal set of keys, you have 20,000 keys. And the epigenome is the piano player. And over time, she starts to lose her eyesight. She can't play the, the notes. And initially, you don't notice if she plays a few notes that are wrong. That's your teenage years. But over time, as you get older, it's a cacophony, and you, wouldn't, you would just walk out on the concert. But what we are trying to do is to find a way to tell that pianist how to read the notes again, give her glasses so she can see again, or just get rid of her and get a, get a new pianist. All right, so I've jumped from a CD to an island. Just very briefly, we think that life was set up to be this way because it's very important to coordinate uh, your epigenome with DNA damage. And this is an example of what, what the early Earth looked like four billion years ago, we think. And uh, it was full of noxious gases and that there were early life forms living on there. But there were life forms that had a very particular gene survival circuit that was composed of only two genes. One that controlled how genes are turned on and off, and then a gene that makes a protein that repairs DNA. And the reason for that is you don't want to always be growing because sometimes times are tough. When you're hit by cosmic rays or you run out of food, you shouldn't keep dividing and producing offspring. 
you want to hunker down, and those are the life forms that survived on the early Earth, and we are the descendants of those cells. And we carry that same survival, genetic survival circuit in our cells today. Without that survival circuit, we couldn't repair DNA, and we couldn't survive. But if my theory is correct, that is also the reason that we age. So this is my representation of a chromosome here. And these, these balls here, these uh, yellow and blue balls, represent proteins that control genes. These are epigenetic regulators. And the ones that we work on that I'll tell you about later are called sirtuins. But there are many of them in the cell. But it's the principle I want to get across tonight. What we've discovered in things as simple as yeast cells and even true in mammals is that when we damage a piece of DNA, if we get in the sun too much, like an, a stupid young Australian kid that I was, or we have too many x-rays, or, you know, God forbid you have to undergo chemotherapy, you're going to be damaging the DNA. And in response, you'll see in this diagram, these proteins will have to move to help repair it. That's part of the survival circuit that helps turn on the response. But over time, if you keep repeating this pattern, you will lose the original pattern like playing a tennis game and losing the tennis balls out of the court. Now, this is a nice theory. We, we had a fair amount of evidence for this uh, over the last 25 years. But we didn't have proof, or at least a really good test of cause and effect. And that's what we like to do as scientists, if we're really going to test a theory rigorously. So what we decided to do was basically that, but in a living organism. We'd done it in cells. We'd done it in human cells. We'd done it in yeast. But what if we took? an animal and did that. If the theory is correct, right, we should get epigenomic noise, epigenetic noise, and we should get aging. Now, it took us 10 years, and our publication just came out online, if you'd like to Google it. And I'm going to tell you about that tonight. Now, we engineered a mouse, um, and you know, hats off to the mice. Thank you for the sacrifice for the greater good. We engineered a strain of mice where we could cut their chromosome, but not cause mutations, and distract those proteins and get them to move around. And if we're right, those mice should get old in every way. And that clock that you can measure should advance faster. Now, if we're wrong, and there's 99.9% you know, .9 chance we're wrong, the mice would die, they'd get cancer, or nothing would happen. And most people said that would be the case. But what we got was the following. We scratched the CD in these mice, and they got old. These mice are exactly the same age, with identical genomes. They haven't got any difference in, certain, in terms of mutations. They're mutating at the same rate. But when they were young, we scratched the CD of one of them, the one on the right. So what did we actually do? We, we put in a gene from a slime mold that we could uh, get, and we turned it on for three weeks when the mouse was young. The mouse didn't notice. It was quite happy. It was though you know you get an X-ray, you don't feel that. But then, because we disrupted its epigenome, its cells started to age. They started to lose their identity. What made those nerve cells in that mouse's brain started to go away. And we find that the mouse on the right, its cells have largely lost their identity. They're barely functioning, and they're becoming like a melange of, of a variety of cells. So let me put it this way. Aging, we believe, is the loss of cellular identity. The question, though, is, uh, oh, by the way, what, what that ends up is, if it goes too far, is senescence. And those cells hunker down, they stop dividing, and then they wreak havoc, including inflammation. But then the question is, uh, are they truly old? And as I mentioned, we can measure their age. And this is based on those chemicals that naturally accumulate the one that we can do in our bodies or in mice. In this case, we've measured their blood biological age. Not their, can not their birthday candles, but their actual biological age. And the red dots represent that mouse on the top. And it's 50% older. And if you look at its organs, the organs are also older. And if you look at, at its biochemistry, its biochemistry is older. And they live shorter. And they develop all the signs of aging. In fact, we can dial this up. We can accelerate aging quite severely in these mice. We can make them age within a matter of months. And what we're excited about is that these mice could serve as a model for human aging and human diseases. 
when we've had very poor success in treating Alzheimer's disease. And I would argue the reason is we're testing our drugs on mice that are only six months old. How can you expect that to yield important results? So, but these mice, we can age them 80 years within a matter of months if we want to. We just feed them a drug called uh, doxycycline, and then it turns it on. So on the left, you can see on this slide, are these chemical groups, these methyls, which are in gray. And there are enzymes called TETs that remove these methyls. That'll be important in a minute. But what we're asking, over the, what in my lab we were asking over the last two years, was can we take an old mouse and remove those chemicals in a, the right way to make that clock young again? Now, we don't want to strip all the methyls off. You might say, well, don't you just turn on those tets and get rid of those methyls. Well, if we do that, you know what we get? We get the world's biggest tumor because the cells would just grow like a cancer. What we needed to do was to get back the pianist that can play just the right notes at the right time, at the right place. That's pretty hard to do, a lot harder than creating, um, stripping off these methyls. Now, stripping off the methyls is not, is not stupid. Um, as you'll see, it's a very important part of biology now. Now, one of the important things that you need to know is that adult neurons, after we're born, they don't regrow. But if we're very young, or if, say, we're still in the uterus, if we damage our optic nerve or our spine, it can grow back. And there are some species that can grow back entire arms or tails. And there are jellyfish that can go from a few cells and respawn an entire new individual. So aging and new body parts can be regrown and reset. But our nerves are the most pathetic cells in the body. You damage them once, and they're never coming back. So we like a challenge in my lab. Uh, and a student in my lab, Wan Cheng Lu, decided that perhaps we could try to reprogram neurons to be young again by tickling those TET enzymes to get back the pianist. And what we expected to see was that if we were right, we should be able to regrow nerves in the animal um, instead of having them sit around and, and just vegetate. All right, so this is uh, Wan Cheng Lu on the right. He's just a young... 20-something-year-old guy who grabbed his PhD by the horns and went for it. The man to his left is Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012. This photo was taken actually yesterday. Um, they were hanging out at Harvard. Um, and this is a dream come true for Wan Chang because his research, our research, stands on the shoulder of this guy. So sh if you don't know Yamanaka, he found that there was a combination of genes four genes, called Yamanaka genes, that if you put them into adult cells, let's say one of your skin cells, you can reprogram those cells completely to be a stem cell and then coax those cells to be just about any other cell type you want. You can make sperm, you can make egg, you can make both, you can fertilize them if you want. A remarkable discovery and well deserving of a Nobel Prize. But we decided that putting all four Yamanaka factors into an animal would not be a good thing. As I mentioned, you'd get the world's biggest tumor. So just a little bit about Yamanaka factors. They're called O, S, K, and M for short. OC4, SOX2, KLA4, and MYC. These are what's called transcription factors that control uh, other genes, including those TET enzymes that scrub the DNA of those methyls. But what we didn't know was, is it possible to partially reprogram a cell, not to be primordial and stem-like, but just enough safely to be young again, to polish that CD and play the music of our youth once again. And the brilliant breakthrough that came from Wan Chang was that he said, you know, there's a problem here. One of those genes is an oncogene, meaning it can cause cancer. So he left off that gene at the end, MYC, and he just built a virus that contained O, S, and K, packaged it up, and injected it in, into a mouse to see what would happen. Now, we had some idea that this might work because a fellow called, um, a professor, I should say, uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte, a good friend of mine at the Salk Institute, a few years ago had shown that if you turn on all four of these genes in a mouse, a short-lived mouse, uh, it would die within two days. Now, that's not gonna make headlines and it's not gonna be an FDA-approved therapy anytime soon. 
But what he did do that was very clever was he turned those genes off again after two days and the mice recovered from their, their stress. And he kept doing that for the rest of their life. Now that's a horrible treatment to a mouse, but those mice lived 40% longer. But everybody that I talked to said, that's just an artifact. If you stress a mouse and almost kill it every two days, that's what's gonna happen. But we believed in it, and what Wan Cheng did is quite remarkable. Now, we have collaborators at Harvard, and I really owe them a great debt. We're not expert at uh, optic nerve crush. But uh, the lab that we collaborated with is, and what they did was they pinched the back of an optic nerve of a mouse, and that's a, the best model to understand how to regrow nerves, which one day may be used either to regrow the eye or to fix spinal cord or other injuries. But right now, science is at a stage where you can barely grow back any nerves at all. So what you can see up here, hopefully, is that this is a nerve that was pinched across here. And a lot of these nerves where it's orange stain died off. This should be bright orange. And these are the ends of the nerves that run that way uh, towards me. That's, they're heading towards the brain, and they've all died off because of the pinch after about two weeks. Now, we did the same experiment, but we introduced with a, a virus a gene therapy that we could turn on with an antibiotic, doxycycline, and we fed the mice doxycycline and had a look what happened. And what we saw was quite remarkable, that the nerves started growing back towards the brain. Somehow they knew where to grow. And if we leave this longer, they grow all the way back to the brain, which is quite a distance. And we know that if we get rid of those tet, tet genes, those methyl erase genes, part of the, the, the epigenetic clock, this doesn't work. That's pretty interesting. Now, how, how do you tell if a mouse can regain eyesight? Now, in this experiment, what we're doing is we're not crushing the eye. We did a couple of things. We gave mice glaucoma pressure-induced damage to the retina. And that was re their vision was largely restored by a virus, at least 50%, which is unheard of. Glaucoma you can't typically cure. Now, these are old mice. These are one-year-old mice. And these mice lose their vision at one year of age. And ignore the feces. That's irrelevant. They're just a bit scared, standing on a platform. But what Bruce Cassandra did, our colleague, was he showed the mice a moving line and if mice can see, they will move their head. By the way, so will we. It's called the optomotor response. Now, this old mouse, mouse has not been treated, so you wouldn't expect it to be able to see. We can also, by the way, put electrodes back there and see if, if we're just fooling ourselves. But we do, we do that too. But now, let me see if I can get the next slide going. So this is an old mouse that has been treated for a few weeks with our gene therapy to reprogram the retina to be young again. And we find that it can see just as well as a young mouse again. We've completely restored its vision. So what that tells us is parts of the body, particularly the retina, are probably not degenerated. They, they just forgot that they were optic nerves. And you can reprogram them to work again, which is stunning. What that means is there's a backup copy of youth in all of our cells, if we're right. And it also means that this DNA methylation clock, this epigenetic clock that we can measure, may not just be a measure of age, but it might actually be part of the system. It's as crazy as the following, that if, if you have a clock on the wall and you move the hands backwards, you know, we would say that doesn't, can, doesn't change the actual time. It doesn't move time backwards. But what this is saying is that maybe it does change time. It really does change our biological age. Um, and so we hope to do tests in glaucoma patients in about two years with gene therapy in the eye. But we're also going as fast as we can to identify simpler ways to reprogram parts of the body. Uh, we haven't found any safety issues. We've had this gene therapy delivered in the veins of mice for over a year, and they're doing perfectly fine. So we're not causing tumors as far as we know. And we're optimistic that this could be a new way to rejuvenate the body and reset the clock. Now, we don't know how many times you can reset the clock, actually. We've done it once. But what if you could reset the body 100 times, 1,000 times? That's when things get really interesting. But you might be saying, oh, David, this is, this is going to cost a lot of money, and it's not going to be around for another few years. And even then, I don't know if I can get it. Um, 
So what can I do now? Well, if there's one word that you might want to take home with you, it's this one, hormesis. It basically means anything that doesn't kill you will make you stronger and longer lived. We cannot let our bodies become complacent. And it all goes back to that original survival circuit in the early life on the planet. It responded to stress. And if we don't activate it, it just sits there and it doesn't defend the body. So you want to tickle it. But of course, if you step on a snail, it's not going to live longer. It's just going to die. What we want to do is to tickle it. So how do we do that? We give it a little bit of stress. A little bit is good. A lot of it is bad. And there are factors that we've discovered, such as mTOR and AMPK, and the ones that I work on called sirtuins, that are in all of our bodies that are activated by a bit of hormesis. And there are other ways of activating, such as with drugs like rapamycin, which is a, an immunosuppressant, so I don't recommend that. Uh, metformin, I'll talk about in a, in a bit. And I work on these molecules here, uh, what are called NAD boosters. And there are al there's also resveratrol, uh, which uh, Dr. Schwartz talked about, which uh, was the, just a proof of concept molecule. We have much better molecules now. So if there's one thing I can tell you in your daily lives to do, after, after reading thousands of scientific papers and researching a lot of animals and humans, um, it would be this. Eat less often. Not starvation, not malnutrition, not at all. But three meals a day with snacks in between, never feeling hungry our whole lives, that's ludicrous. And I don't even know why nutritionists ever recommended that. Naturally, we're supposed to be hungry. And without that, our inbuilt defenses that I just showed you on the slide remain relatively inactive. Our bodies don't fight disease, they don't fight aging. So eat less. Uh, what I do, and I don't tell anybody what to do, but what I do is I skip breakfast as best I can and I eat a late lunch and sometimes I go all the way to dinner. That works for me. Some people skip two or three days, sometimes a week. But please, whatever you do, don't always be full. It's craziness and no wonder we have an obesity epidemic with that attitude. Get up and move. Now, this is not new. You don't need someone from my lab to come and tell you this. But what we've learned is that the reason exercise works so well is because it's activating these longevity genes. And with small molecules that we found, such as these NAD boosters and resveratrol, we can actually mimic the benefits of exercise. And we, when you combine them with exercise, we think you can have an even greater health benefit. But move. Go for a walk. If you're able to do it, lose your breath, run a little bit, but really you've got to move and maintain that body strength as well. Lift some weights, stretch, because um, as Dr. Ruth said earlier today, uh, the most important thing to, to living a long life is hanging on to the handrail or to good looking men. <laughs> they both work. Um, I also looked at other types of hormesis. This is the sauna. I was skeptical that this was true. Of course, heating your body, that's craziness. If we heat yeast cells, they live longer, but a human body, that's craziness. But actually, the data is interesting. I think it's compelling that a number of studies in Scandinavia have found, looking at thousands of mostly businessmen, uh, caveat, that they are protected against heart disease. So I think that that may work. And if nothing else, you'll feel good in the middle of winter. Uh, cold baths. Now, this also, I thought, was unlikely to work or do anything. But actually, even in my field, these sirtuin defenses are activated by being cold. There's one in particular called SIRT3. There are seven in total. SIRT3 comes on when you're cold and helps cells survive and also increases their metabolism. And it gets activated by building brown fat, which can uh, be coaxed into existence and proliferation uh, typically on your shoulder blades. And we didn't even know this kind of brown fat was there until about a decade ago. So these days, I do that. Uh, I jump in a cold pool with my son every weekend after being in the sauna. And at the very least, I feel quite lucky to still be alive. <laughs> so there's uh, this plant here. It's uh, the French lilac, or goat's rue. Uh, it's a less popular name. And it produces a, a molecule called guanidine. And the, these guanines actually are, have, were found to be quite useful for treating uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Uh, and then scientists actually, chemists, went to work and created better versions of this. Um, there's a um, biguanide, 
uh, called metformin, which is the frontline therapy across the world for type 2 diabetes or high blood sugar. And actually, the World Health Organization uh, has declared it an essential medicine for humanity. So what does metformin do? Well, it certainly helps the liver, and it helps your body take up glucose from the bloodstream. That's why it's used as a diabetes treatment. But it's also been found in my, with my colleagues and I to extend a mouse's lifespan. And this pathway, remember I mentioned AMPK, that's one of the three main pathways for longevity that we've all discovered. And it has multi-actions. It works on fat, it works on the immune system. And studies of now 100 plus thousand people around the world who've taken metformin indicate pretty strongly, in my opinion, to protect against many diseases of aging, from cancer to heart disease, uh, even frailty and, alts and, uh, and cancer. So this is really, uh, I think, the closest we have to evidence that there is a drug already out there that can slow aging. And there are many of my colleagues taking this molecule, myself included. Um, resveratrol, I won't belabor the point. It's all over the news, has been. Um, if you like red wine and you needed an excuse to drink, you're welcome. Um, it's not bad for you in small doses. But the doses that I take are the equivalent every morning to drinking 500 to 1,000 glasses of red wine. And I do not recommend that. So don't do that. But resveratrol seems to be a pretty interesting molecule because what it does is it activates one of these sirtuin enzymes. And we've discovered that it does this. Um, and we can actually stop the, the enzyme from doing this in a mouse. And sh we've shown, though we haven't published yet, that if a mouse can't do this action, resveratrol will not make it live longer anymore. Pretty much proving that our ideas are correct. Now, there are drugs that have been developed, or at least are being developed, that are better than resveratrol. And those have been into phase two studies showing efficacy and in inflammation. But they remain to be marketed. NAD boosters, uh, if anyone here has been on the internet recently or Googled my name, this will come up. There are a few NAD boosters. You can certainly read more about it if you'd like to pick up a copy of my book. I don't want to go on and on about it. But what's interesting about NAD is that sirtuin enzymes that I just showed you don't work without NAD. And the levels of NAD, we think, go down as we get older. And so NAD boosters get you your youthful levels of NAD, and we think fight back. So some of the evidence comes from mice. These are 20-month-olds mice. Sorry about the black mice on a black treadmill. But one of these mice clearly is fitter than the other one, and it's the one that's been drinking NMN in its water. And what we traced this to was that the SIRT1 enzyme, the sirtuin, in the lining of the blood vessels was responsible. And it was mimicking the effects of exercise. And that's why these untrained mice now ran multi-marathons and, in fact, ran so far that the, the machine stopped running. Um, and we had to rewrite the software because the software uh, didn't anticipate mice running over three kilometers. OK, so we stand at the precipice of an interesting world where what I've told you today is that it's feasible that we will not just slow aging, but we will reverse the aging process. And this is an example. Now, I chose Bill Murray just for, for the heck of it. It could be anybody. But imagine a world where you get uh, gene therapy when you're young. And these viruses sit in your body, lying in wait. They're not on. But if you have an accident, you cut yourself, you break your spine, you damage your eye, you'll get an IV of an antibiotic that will turn on the reprogramming, will make you into the, basically an axolotl and salamander, regrow what you need to regrow. You'll go back to be young. We don't know how young yet. Um, and then you go off the antibiotic. And perhaps we could keep resetting the body every decade or so. That's a possible future that our children or our great-grandchildren may actually see. Now, remember my father, who was born in 1939. Now, he's now 80. And he was not looking forward to his old age. My mother died from lung cancer. She lived a terrible life as well. His mother as I mentioned, died a uh, very terrible life. We have heart disease riddled in our Ashkenazi Jew uh, family. And I also have, have terrible genes, massive cholesterol. So my father surviving to 80 is a world's first, as far as we know, in our family. But what he gives us is hope that we can intervene. So my father is on the same, essentially the same program that I am. It does involve the things I've told you today and a few other tweaks, which if you want to read on page 302, you're welcome to. I, I wrote all those down. Um, I know people would be interested. Um, and also write to me if, if you'd like. 
But my father is a beacon of hope, as is Dr. Ruth, that we don't have to accept aging. We don't have to accept uh, just the way it goes. The same way we never accepted cancer or heart disease as just the way it goes. And just this um, August, my father, who I'm showing you here in the middle picture, uh, we went to Africa together, and he climbed the mountains in Uganda to visit the gorillas. And we explored the, the great uh, journey of humanity from fossils all the way up the Great Rift Valley. And I'll tell you that that was when I realized what I was working on was that important. Um, it becomes very personal, actually, when it's part of your family. And with the smile on my father's face that you can see here, he's gone from a grumpy guy to a guy that just loves life. He just ordered his dream car on a wait list at 80. This is the, the, not the a kind of guy that you'd think would be, would be old, but he has no aches or pains. He started a new career a few years ago and is looking forward to meeting his great grandkids. And that's a life I want us all to be able to look forward to. It'll be a world where we'll have a lot less expenditure for healthcare, and the wisdom of our elders will be admired and absorbed by our youth that really need our advice as this world becomes more complicated and scary for them. And I want to say thank you all for spending your night with me and the Trottiers for making this all possible. Thank you. We will take some questions. Uh, if you would line up, line up at the microphones, we can do that. I'd like, David, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on, on diet. I mean, you mentioned about eating less and skipping meals, but what about the content of the food? Yeah, well, the, there's always a new diet. There's always a new food content, and it's being played out all the time. We hear, meat is good, don't eat meat, avoid carbs. And everybody's confused, myself included. But there was an experiment that one of my colleagues did at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and that was really telling. And let me tell you that little anecdote. Uh, there was a study in monkeys uh, that went for 30 years. And some of the monkeys at the National Institutes of Health didn't live a long time on a calorie-restricted diet. They were actually pretty healthy, but they didn't live longer. Whereas the one that was at the University of Wisconsin, which is now run by one of my former trainees, Rosalind Anderson, they did live longer, statistically. And it was a big food fight. Um, it was a silly food fight, because all, the, all of the monkeys were healthier, of course. But what they tried to figure out was, why does one group of monkeys live longer and the other not? And there were differences in the diet. So what Rafael de Cabo did was he took a massive mouse colony of 10,000 and gave many different groups, different combinations of carbohydrate, fat, um, and protein. And he thought that he would figure out that the one that was best was the one that was given to the monkeys that lived a long time. Turns out it didn't matter what he fed them. It didn't matter what they ate. It mattered when they ate. It turned out if you let mice eat food any time of the day or night when they typically eat, they lived a fairly short lifespan. But if you only gave them the food for a short period of two hours a day, they ate about the same amount as the others because they're gorging themselves, but they all lived longer. So that to me says, it's at least if that's tr translatable to humans, that it's more important about being hungry than it is about exact composition. Now, I could talk all about uh, plants and the molecules like, like resveratrol that we call them xenohormetic molecules that give us the, the benefits of stress without actually having to stress our bodies our, uh, ourselves. Um, and I'm not saying go out and eat um, fast food all day. That's not going to help you either. Um, but I would like people to, to focus more on when they eat than they currently do. <clears throat> there are many resveratrol supplements on the market. You go into any health food store, and there'll be dozens. And <clears throat> I understand that they're not all really resveratrol, right? Resveratrol is not uh, that easy to keep stable for a long time. So how would anyone know which one to buy if they decide to try resveratrol? Uh, well, you can write to me. But publicly, I don't talk about products for a few very good reasons. One is I'm a professor at Harvard. Um, 
The other is I haven't tested products for many years, so I don't know which ones literally today have the right components. And the third is if I talk about products, I mean, I've, had, I've been dragged into lawsuits for saying stuff, and they're a highly litigious bunch. Um, and you know what that's like. And uh, so, you know, privately we can talk, but publicly I, I don't talk about products. But uh, I think that we can take for granted that they're not all the same, right? I mean, there are dozens of resveratrol supplements. and, and Well, there, there are. I mean, I can speak generally. I don't want to leave you with mystery. Uh, most resveratrol products that I know of are legitimate. Um, it's not that hard. It's not that expensive. But not all, and you don't know which is best. I, I would go, if you want to try, a trusted supplier that, that is a reputable brand, one that is ultra pure, don't get the 50% stuff. There's even mixtures that can give you diarrhea. Um, and, and that's really what to look for. And then there's also GMP, there's GMP in Canada as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, the GMP is good manufacturing uh, practices and, and that you wanna see because that means at least they've, they try to, to be as good as uh, nearly like a pharmaceutical grade. No, there's, there's a difference between micronized uh, resveratrol and bigger particle size, right? Well, yeah, yeah, micronized is the way to go because resveratrol is, is essentially like eating brick dust. It will not get absorbed, it's very insoluble, and some of the clinical trials were screwed up because they just gave their patients, their test subjects, a pill. But what we know from human studies in my lab, and certainly in my lab with these mice, if you take it with some fat, or as I do with a bit of yogurt, it'll dissolve and be absorbed about five times better. Yes, sir. I don't think this is on. Uh, on the subject of uh, more on the cosmetic side, uh, I was hoping you might mention hyaluronic acid. Uh, this seems to be one of the more popular ingredients these days, very pricey. Do you have any comments on that, on the eff efficacy and so forth? Well, um, hyaluronic acid will work as a moisturizer. It's a barrier you put on the skin. But hyaluronic acid can also be injected and uh, as a filler, and it works like that. But I think as part of a cream, not so sure. Uh, Dr. Benchich, perhaps, uh, as part of a cream, it's not much use, right? Yeah. So the yeah, the, the, there's a third way. You, you can stimulate HAS2, which is the, the, AS2, the, the enzyme that makes hyaluronic acid in the skin. And res, we discovered resveratrol does that, so that might be one way it works. You talked about the ingestion of foodstuffs and what happens at the molecular level. Have you looked at the effect of the individual metabolism? I'm a person who will not gain weight no matter how much I eat. My wife's very jealous. But does that make any difference in the chain of events that you're talking about? I, I'm sure it does. And we, we don't know enough about how each of us responds to these medicines. And what I do may not be right for someone like yourself, because I have the opposite body type. I'm very jealous. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're very quickly entering a world where we don't have to fly blind, that we can actually measure our bodies. And we need to do that. We can measure our blood, obviously. Um, soon it'll just be like a little Band-Aid on the skin. Um, there are ways, I had a, a glucose sensor under my arm for many weeks that was telling me how my body responded to the medicines and food I was eating. It was very informative. I have a ring that tells me uh, a lot about my body, heart rate, sleep, body temperature, motion. Um, but yeah, right now, this is the problem, is that we're not one size fits all at all. Um, unfortunately, it takes a lot of data to be able to make sure that each of us gets the right medicine at the right time. Um, and we don't have a, a lot of that data. You raise another important point. We don't know even when these supplements should be taken, what's the best time. And should you take metformin when you're exercising? There are some indications that metformin may blunt the muscle building effects of exercise. So we're still trying to figure this all out. What I've done is use my body as, as a guinea pig to try and learn things that I might otherwise have taken 20 years to at least have a glimpse into. I think tomorrow Dr. Ruth will tell us that size does not matter. <laughs> but, but I think you're going to tell us that size does matter. Size, right? of, size of the meal. But... But size, body size in terms of longevity. 
Oh, well, that, that's without a doubt. Uh, the, the, the more petite you are, the, the better chance you have of living a long time. Anyone who's had a dog knows that. Um, that that's not to be argued with. And there, there are some races of people who have mutations in uh, IGF-1 receptor that are small stature, and they are believed to be resistant uh, but more than most people to diseases of aging. So yeah, if, if you're small, as I was in school, it really sucked. I got picked on a lot. But as I get older, I'm actually uh, quite glad. Yeah, the front. Lady in the front. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, maybe it was asked before, but uh, do chemicals in food and all the like preservatives and everything, is that what really makes us get, uh, get the, uh, store fat? That's what I, I heard somewhere, that the, the body doesn't recognize chemicals as food. So whatever you're in, taking in with those chemicals just is stored as fat. Is that true? Whenever I think I've heard the ultimate is something else that comes up. I've never heard that preservatives make you fat. This I've not heard. I've oh. heard all kinds of claims against preservatives, but not that one. Oh, so okay. <clears throat> I have I've no reason to think that preservatives play any role in making you fat. No. Uh, me neither. I, but I, I can tell you what does make okay. you fat. We, we all know that. Um, Ice cream? I, <laughs> so so can, I, can I tell you another quick lesson that you've, you've raised here? You, you want to get your body out of being feeling comfortable, right? As I showed you today, being cold, being hot, certainly being hungry, exercising, being puffed. That's what is telling your body that times may be adverse in the, in the future. If you eat stressed food, we think we also get the benefits from those plants that are stressed out. And by stressed, I don't mean nervous. I mean biological threat. Um, and those genes that protect us, they, they don't get activated unless you tell them to be activated. And if you don't push your body into being in a state of non-complacency, you will live an average lifespan. But if you want to live beyond that, you need to do some extra things. So you've got to torture yourself into living long. <laughs> but here's the good news. You don't have to run a marathon. Just being a little puffed on a treadmill a few times a week for, for 10 minutes is apparently just as good as, as running all those miles. Sir. So. Good evening, doctor. And welcome to Montreal, even though I came from Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> You mentioned, I, I found it earlier uh, when you're talking about supplements, there's a plethora of information out there uh, in terms of whether it's diet, whether it's keto diet, the paleo diet, and also that you have those theorists and um, those people that uh, say that one should take some supplements as an enhancement towards your health, even though you had said that you're not really high on taking antioxidants, although resveratrol is also marketed as an antioxidant. Um, I'd like to think more in terms of um, one's parents. And if one is lucky enough to still have their parents, they were brought up in a generation that maybe milk was delivered in a bottle, and things weren't so adulterated as they are now let alone the environmental factors too. So I guess my question to you is, what about the age-old modem of just everything in moderation, um, smile every day, and do the best you can? Yeah, I'll, I clap to that. But yeah, it, I, I agree with that. Uh, now, that's not all you can do. If we're going to make it all into our 90s in a healthy way, I think we're going to need a little more. Some of us are not blessed with good genes or short stature. And so that's why we're working on these medicines as well. Um, but I, I agree with you that, that, that those are the, the, the things at a minimum we should be doing. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Sinclair. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, regarding um, caloric restriction causing longevity, the reverse is true also. Obesity, morbid obesity, which is inflicting our society, cause early atherosclerosis, inflammation, and most importantly, cancer. My question is, is the science pointing out that what caloric restriction is doing by skipping meals, the overall food contake into the digestive tract, you're just getting less toxins that your body has to neutralize? Is there any science that the basic concept that you're showing and many people are showing around the world, the less we eat, the longer we live, and the more we overeat, the faster we die? Is it that simple? Is this like 
is there any scientific hardcore evidence that this is all toxins or things in the diet, like we talk about carbohydrates and meats, you know, they're full of pesticides, hormones, steroids, whatever, carcinogens. Right, so my, my best estimate, um, and Dr. Schwartz should speak up because he's also an expert, um, it's a really minor component. I wouldn't be fretting o over that as much. I mean, th there are simple things you can do, don't microwave plastics, don't expose yourself to, to, to toxins that you know exist, uh, don't eat the yellow printer dye in your cartridge, that, that's carcinogenic. But, you know, th those things are fine, but, but that's not what's causing aging. Um, and that's not why eating certain foods is accelerating aging and why being obese makes the clock tick faster. What science tells us today is the reason that being obese accelerates the clock is that it's shutting down the body's defenses against the loss of epigenetic change. So those sirtuins that we've discovered, they get turned on by raising an ED um, and by exercise and by being hungry. And the older you are, the fatter you are, the lazier you are, um, the less NAD you'll have and the less active your body will be at fighting disease. Now there's other pathways, of course, not just sirtuins, but that's the main reason. Um, not because of toxins. Thank you. Do you have any idea, roughly, how many calories you consume? No. No. Okay. What, what I did that was, I think, helpful was I went to Thailand, where, by the way, I picked up some metformin. That you can just buy it at the chemist. But um, I got some fitted shirts made, and they're really tight. So unless I want to go buy a whole new wardrobe, I have to keep the same weight, and I find that very <laughs> useful. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I um, just had a, a clarification if possible regarding getting hungry. I, I'm assuming you're talking about intermittent fasting. So we're, do the studies show if there are specific hours that are more effective than others or times of day that are more effective than others? Like uh, you mentioned, yeah. you skip breakfast. So right. are you on a five hour eat cycle, eight hours? Does that make a difference, yeah, five or eight? I mean, so, so we really don't, don't know the answer. Anyone who says they do is, is making it up. But what I think is that we're all different. And I recently learned, thanks to that glucose monitor that I, I had on my arm, is that I'm one of the people that has a huge spike in blood sugar in the morning. So for me, eating makes no sense. And I, in fact, I feel sick if I eat in the morning. That's me. There are some people who wake up starving with low blood glucose where it makes sense to eat. And then perhaps they want to have a tiny dinner or skip it. But the, you need to have a period of extended time, so it's 16 to 18 hours, we think, to get the most benefit. And how you want to do that is fine. I find sleeping without eating to be the easiest. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but, but my point is, you can figure it out for yourself. And, but if, well, the, if the, the, it's very hard to do I initially. Ask is because I'm not hungry all day, but at 8 o'clock, I want my big meal. At 8 p.m.? Yeah. yeah. But I could stay up pretty urge. well. <laughs> uh, I have the same problem. But if there's two problems with eating really late. One is you'll have high blood sugar levels throughout the night, and you're act you won't activate your longevity pathways. But also, you won't sleep as well. And that, that's been well proven. And I learned that for myself by wearing one of these sensor rings uh, called an aura ring. OK, thank you. You've mentioned the <clears throat> biological age is measured by DNA methylation. How accurate is that? Yeah, so the DNA methylation clock is scarily accurate. It's, uh, more, it's, it can estimate your biological age within 5% or less. Um, now, it doesn't mean that it's going to predict that you'll get hit by a bus or get, a, get cancer so much, but, but it does say when, you, when all the diseases of aging are going to catch up with you. Because even if you are resisting heart disease, even if you cure that disease, all the other diseases are going to hit you because they're all going up thousandfold uh, by the time you're 70 or 80. Have there nine. been any studies on, on measuring people's biological age, let's say in their 30s and 40s, and seeing what eventually happens to them? Uh, yes, um, not, not that experiment, but there are, there are longitudinal studies where people have taken blood samples from the 1960s and 70s, and it does predict longevity very accurately. That's why Stephen Horvath at UCLA uh, can, has published what he calls the grim age calculator, 
which really does predict it. And it but it actually makes sense to me because in, in my theory of epigenetic aging, the information theory of aging, these methyl groups are an indicator of the information noise, uh, the epigenetic noise that our bodies are accumulating, and that's leading to our, the dysfunction of our organs, which we call aging and doctors call disease. How, how easy is it to determine that? Uh, right now it'll cost you a few hundred dollars in the lab. Commercially, it's probably gonna, if somebody starts a company, it's probably gonna be a thousand or so. But I've got a student working on this who wants to bring the cost of that test down to five dollars. And then, you know, then it'll be fine. We can so all do I it. would think that that would be a big motivating factor to rearrange your eating schedule if you saw that here. Well, that's exactly right. So we know more about our cars with our dashboards than we know about our bodies. And the idea of going to a doctor for an annual physical will soon to our children seem ludicrous. It already does. Um, so we need full-time monitoring. That world is coming. It might seem strange to us, but the idea of wearing a sensor patch, a ring, a watch, even having our car seats measure our heartbeat, that's a world that is going to be very normal soon. And that will tell us when things are going wrong way sooner than we would otherwise be able to detect, and also tell us what to eat and when to optimize our health. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Sinclair and uh, Dr. Schwartz. Um, I know we spoke a little bit about methylation and demethylation of histones. Uh, this is more of a question for Dr. Sinclair. Um, what, do you, what do you think about uh, telomeres and now extending telomeres to potentially extend lifespans and the idea that this might be potentially a solution in aging? Getting... Yeah, so telomeres were all the rage in the 1990s. Now, they're, they're one of the hallmarks of aging. So we haven't, I'm not scratching those off the list, excuse the pun, but what I am <laughs> saying is that it's not the be all and end all. It's not the primary cause of all the other stuff that goes wrong. Um, that said, there are some organs that replicate very fast and do shorten those telomeres, the liver and the skin, for example. Um, but the more I talk to my colleagues, there are an equal uh, skepticism that this is the, if you just extend your telomeres, well, everything will go away. That's not true. Now, there is someone in Spain, Maria Blasco, who's releasing papers that are really intriguing. She can extend the life, sorry, the, 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 the telomeres of a mouse, and those mice live longer and have less cancer. But what's weird is mice don't age due to telomere loss, but extending them does make them live longer. So there's something else about telomeres that we don't fully understand. And it may be that those telomeres are all part of this epigenetic program where proteins are moving around. And by having long telomeres, you actually have more epigenetic stability. That's what I think is really going on, but we'll have to see. What about the, the theory that's really all over the web these days that if you have cancer, you really have to cut back on sugar and that glucose feeds the cancer? Well, so I'm not an, I'm not a, an oncologist, um, but I know a lot of oncologists at Harvard. My neighbor is one, and he actually uh, developed prostate cancer. And so using him as an example, he he'd immediately, immediately went on a keto diet um, and started taking metformin. Now, there are certain types of cancers that respond to that treatment. Not all, but some. Um, and I list those in my book if you want to learn more. Um, but yeah, it, it's valid science that cancers love to use sugar, some of them. It's called the Warburg metabolism, Warburg effect. Um, but I think you need to figure out with your doctor whether it's worth doing this for your particular type of cancer. Have you uh, considered um, looking at the link between the epigenetic noise and the autophagy, autophagy, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, autophagy or autophagy. Autophagy is, if you don't know, it's the cell's ability to, to digest proteins and recycle them, the garbage or trash can of, of the cell. Um, so normally we, we do a good job of it, but not perfect, and that's why we think we accumulate these plaques in the brain among other tissues. Um, and if you fast for three days, actually you turn on a very deep cleanse called chaperone-mediated autophagy. So that's another reason to, to go hungry. And autophagy is very good, and it, and it does extend the lifespan of animals and probably helps us as well. Um, in terms of the epigenetic theory of aging, we think that autophagy gets screwed up uh, because the genes that are controlling autophagy come on at the wrong time and that you get dysregulation of those genes. And one of the reasons is that those mice that we, we caused aging in they have all the hallmarks of aging. They have mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, we think they have defective autophagy, um, senescent cells. And so that's why we think that 
this epigenetic theory is the, the primary dam and that these others are tributaries. Thank you. In the back. Yeah, uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Sinclair and Dr. Joe Schwartz. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, what, I'm, Dr. Sinclair, I'll ask you, what, is the, what are the differences, or qualitative or quantitative differences, between the research that your team is doing and Dr. Um, Aubrey uh, de Grey and um, uh, his SENS Foundation and his company, Ajax? And the second question, um, NMN supplements, not MN, not MNM. I know that's a totally different Don't thing. Eat I know. Yeah, oh, actually, I, I know the. Uh, I'm friends with a woman whose father invented MNMs. It was German. It was a German Jewish scientist who escaped the Holocaust and made it for Hershey's for the U.S. Army. But that's another story. Um, um, I always worry when someone says, "I'll make this short." <laughs> that's it. Okay. Uh, so the MNM. What, what would you look for in a, in a real or a quality MN, uh, yeah. NMN supplement? All right, so, let me much. try to be brief. Um, so the <laughs> a a Ajax, yeah. uh, I just spoke to their CEO a few days ago, okay. and we're working on very similar things, and we hope to collaborate. That's, okay. um, I'm working on reprogramming the eye. They're working on reprogramming other tissues, and so that, that's that answer. On NMN, so there's a few types of NAD boosters. The one that I, I don't like is nicotinamide. That's vitamin B3, a type of vitamin B3. Mm -hmm. The reason is we showed about 15 years ago that high levels of nicotinamide actually inhibit those sirtuin defensive enzymes. And you mm -hmm. don't want to inhibit those. Okay. And there are some other enzymes that are inhibited that you don't want to inhibit. So don't take a mega dose of nicotinamide. Keep it low. Okay. But vitamin D is important. And then, very brief, there's NR and NMN. Um, I have a newsletter on my website, lifespanbook.com, if you'd like to read more. I know I'm rushing. That's why I mentioned it. Um, NR is, is fairly unstable. Keep it in the fridge if you buy it. Um, I can't say publicly uh, who no, to I, get I, it from. There's a number of companies that sure. claim all sorts of things, that NR is better than Anaman. There's a big fight. There's a big lawsuit. Um, I've tested both molecules. They're both very decent in mice, um, but we have to see in humans. But I do want to mention that we're doing clinical trials in people with an NMN-like molecule. Uh, we're going to be trying to treat Friedrich's ataxia, which is a rare disease, starting next year. And uh, I'll keep you updated. Thank you very much. And by the way, I have read your, I've listened to your book, Dr. Sinclair. Listened to, and I think it's the real thing because you're uh, reading it along with a colleague. So I want to say it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi. Um, I, well, basically I'm quite excited about the microbiome <laughs> and given that this epigenome is so interrelated with the digestive system and leptin and ghrelin, I imagine there's communication going there. I was wondering whether we know anything about the connection of our epigenome with the microbiome epigenome and whether they like communicate or what yeah. we know about that. Uh well, that, that's a, a beautiful PhD topic. Um, it hasn't been studied, but I, what I can tell you is um, there are labs that have taken the microbiome of old fish um, out and replaced it with young feces from a young fish, and uh, they've lived longer. So there's clearly something going on, in my view, that the microbiota changes with age, and it may actually be better to replace it with a younger one. We don't know in humans if that's true, but the interplay between the microbiome and our own epigenome I would love to know that, and I'm sure they're talking to each other. Because maybe, you know, in the studies where we said, like, there was not anything obvious between what we're actually eating, maybe they're given that all of our vegetables and stuff that we eat is digested by bacteria. Maybe it's along that process. So we don't okay. We don't know, but our microbiome makes molecules. They even make NMN. And uh, we, we don't know if our microbiome is trying to help us or not, but that's a whole area to explore. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, hi, I hope you're well. Uh, I wanted to ask, what do you think is going to be the biggest social problems moving forward when anti-aging is... Yep. Uh, yep, social problems. Uh, so I've thought a lot about this, and, and I've also talked to plenty of world leaders about this. Uh, and I work with economists in, uh, in London, particularly, trying to model this out, because it's coming. It's just a question of when. Um, there's too much to talk about in one answer, and we're running out of time. Uh, it is in my book. I apologize for keeping on mentioning it, but I do talk about this. 
uh, population? Quick answer is it doesn't go up by much. In fact, it, it will level out no matter what we do. Uh, we're not overbreeding in most Western countries. In fact, we're declining. And we need some help to keep people productive. In Japan, the average farmer is 65 years old. We're screwed without a solution. And actually, if we stopped everybody dying today, population still wouldn't go up by that much. It's what we have to do is bring the wealth of the poor up in all countries, especially in Africa, where I just was trying to help them. And that will reduce the fertility rate across the planet. Okay, and that's the good start. In terms of space, there's really there's plenty of space. There aren't going to be that many people. Humans will level out at about 10 or 11 billion, the World Health Organization and others agree. Um, and then the money that we save, I believe, with being able to keep people healthy in the trillions of dollars can be put towards solving energy, climate, species uh, loss, and other things. That's in a nutshell. In the back. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sinclair, a question about sleep. I've uh, been reading the research uh, in sleep medicine. In particular, there's some interesting uh, references in Dr. Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Uh, fascinating take. And in particular, they've shown in, in several studies that if you are sleep deprived in an acute, just a matter of days or chronically, it has a dramatic and direct effect on your telomeres, it uh, just wrecks the hell out of them, apparently. Uh, I don't think it's widely understood or widely appreciated. Uh, the other main point is that as our, our generation is not sleeping enough, we need eight hours a night to stay healthy, and most of us don't get that. Yeah. Could you comment sure. on the, the link between sleep or poor sleep and aging? Yes, so there is a link. The circadian clock that determines how we feel and how we get jet lag is actually determined by the CERT1 gene that we worked on. And, uh, and NAD levels are cycling through the day. It's one of the reasons I take my NAD booster in the morning to help the NAD levels go back up and why I think it helps me with jet lag. It's intimately connected. If you don't get enough sleep, you're gonna disturb that cycle. Your NAD will be out of whack. There are other things as well. You want to drain your brain with the fluids of all of the proteins that are, you need to get rid of and toxins. So yeah, get enough sleep. And I, I, if I could go back and redo my life again, I would have learned how to get better sleep because it will, I believe, age you faster. Thank you. You spoke of melatonin. Well, I take melatonin. And there's been a really good study that I believe that's, that shows that it, it counteracts the effects of blue light which we're now all exposed to constantly. Uh, and I also wear those uh, orange glasses that filter out blue light every time I'm at home, and that has also helped. <clears throat> Richard uh, Wirtman, who's sort of the guru of melatonin, uh, I spoke to him and, and we were talking about doses, and he thinks that uh, one milligram is better than more. Yeah, I agree, I take a low dose, and uh, yeah, it, it works great for me at least. That one milligram is what you think? Uh, it depends on what bottle I have in the house, but one or three, yeah. In the front. Hi, uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Sinclair and Dr. Schwartz. Um, I just had a question about um, the effect of vitamins on um, longevity. Um, to offer a quick anecdote, um, my, both my grandparents on my father's side, they are in their mid-70s and they take um, a plethora of vitamins every day and I've heard some claims that you should only take vitamins if you have a deficiency and I just wanted to know your opinion on that. Well, I think your grandparents are boosting the economy. <laughs> <laughs> so they're doing some good. But I think mostly they're making for expensive urine. Yeah, I, I would agree um, okay. that, so I don't take a multivitamin, by the way. There, mm -hmm. there are some things in there like iron that I've seen have wreak havoc on the body and create senescent cells. Um, now, if you have a deficiency, that's different. Right. But boosting these things above what they normally should be, I think, is, is not advisable. At least that's what I decide. Now, there's one, there's one difference. So Linus Pauling loved vitamin C and went to his grave fighting for vitamin C. And I grew up in the 70s eating a big tablet of vitamin C. It was supposed to cure colds or prevent colds, remember? But here's one thing that's interesting. Those TET enzymes that remove those methyls to seemingly reverse the clock, they are activated by vitamin C. So one of the things we're testing now in my lab is if they actually do reverse the aging clock a little bit. 
Well, there are a lot of <coughs> interesting trials with uh, IV vitamin C going on now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Pauling may not have been as wrong about the high dose vitamin C as we now think that he, he was. Okay, unfortunately, we are almost at 9 o'clock, so we can only take two more questions. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. Thank you. Fascinating research. It strikes me that we're in a funny kind of race between getting older ourselves and when these new techniques are going to be available for general consumption. Um, I've heard there's a way you can cheat. Some companies have talked about banking your genetic material so that when the breakthroughs happen, you have access to your own genetic material at a younger age to then use in future treatments. Right. Any comments about the efficacy or the promise of those kind of uh, treatments? And do you mean banking stem cells? Stem cells or just whatever uh, genetic material you can, you can provide. Well, it's easy to get genetic material just spit into a tube and put it in the freezer. Uh, it's all over us. But I think stem cells is what people are doing. Do, um, by the way, if, if anyone's in a rush to leave or wants to ask a question, I'm going to stick around. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be out the back at a table with, with some books. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I think that it's possible that, that it'll help. But it's similar to, to cord blood. It, you're betting on the future. Um, but I, I think, Dr. Schwartz, you'd be in a better situation to say something about it. Well, there's no question. Stem cells are uh, the future of medicine. The question is how far that future is. But <clears throat> what you have to be careful there is that there are a lot of, of charlatans jumping on that bandwagon. And we've had a number of them come to Montreal and take out full-page ads in, in the Gazette, much to my chagrin, uh, inviting people to these seminars where they tell them about $5,000 injections, but they recommend three. Uh, in order to basically cure everything. And there's no scientific evidence what they're doing at all, even if they're injecting stem cells. Nobody checks, right. nobody and knows. It'll cost you a few hundred dollars a year just to keep them in a freezer. OK, one more here, and then one more at the back, and that's it. Yeah. Dr. Seclair, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I was fortunate enough to survive a stage four metastatic cancer uh, back in 2006. Unfortunately, there was a price to pay for that. I had to take a, um, uh, a chemo cocktail that was called cisplatinum. I don't know how familiar you are with it. Uh, by the way, I was treated by a brilliant oncologist. I believe he still teaches uh, at Harvard, uh, John Clark. Uh, he's the head of, uh, uh, at the time, in 2006, he was the head of uh, Yaki uh, Oncology Center and at MassGen, and that's where I got treated for the oncology part. Uh, so I had to sign this giant uh, disclosure or, or uh, release uh, acknowledging the fact that there would be progressive side effects to the, uh, the cisplatinum cocktail, uh, which I'm now beginning to experience. Uh, uh, in the last two years, I've noticed that my cognitive functions are diminishing at an accelerated pace. I was wondering if there is uh, any research that points towards the possibility of at least neutralizing, stabilizing, or even possibly uh, regressing the effects of cognitive dysfunction or cognitive decline in patients who have taken uh, cisplatinum or any other uh, yeah. cocktails. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry. that This is what medical technology does, right? Your life was saved, which is incredible. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what it probably has is, is done is accelerated the aging process. But that's another reason why this research is so important. It's not just about aging. It's about helping people like yourself um, and others who have diseases that, that need treating. Uh, in terms of helping the brain, now I'm not the world's greatest expert on cognition. But what I, I can say is that one thing that I'm familiar with is uh, a couple of things. One is in my lab, we were able to not just restore the endurance of those old mice, but actually the blood flow improved in their brain. And I'm hoping to be able to test an NAD booster for cognition. Um, you probably, I'm guessing, have um, decreased vascular flow in your brain in the microvasculature. And I've compensated by using certain natural products that you're probably aware of. 
Um, yeah. Well, we, we can talk later. This shouldn't be a, a medical exam. I'm not even a, a, a doctor. But, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I think it, it highlights, let's talk later, but it highlights the point that today's medicines, many of them, especially chemotherapies, are terrible on the body, even if you, if you, if you do survive. And fortunately, we're moving away from that and using immunotherapy more and more. And that's really where the future has to go. But thank yes, you. Thank Last you. question in the back. Dr. Sinclair, in your presentation, you referred briefly to doxycycline, something, uh, a medication, an antibiotic, which has been around for a very long time. How did it happen that we went from there in the past to now? Oh, because doxycycline, it, it could be any molecule. We just set up our gene therapy to be turned on by doxycycline. and. Uh, we use it because it's cheap and available. It, it doesn't have to be doxycycline. We could re-engineer it to be turned on by another drug. Um, so the doxycycline does nothing, as far as we know, to the, the health of the animal. Actually, we do know. If you just give doxycycline, it doesn't restore vision. It doesn't do anything. You need the gene therapy waiting for the doxycycline to turn on that mm -hmm. set. It's the on switch, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all, and we've learned something here tonight. We, <clears throat> yeah. we, uh, we certainly learned that uh, we shouldn't have fed you uh, tonight before the lecture, because we, sh we should have been fasting instead. <laughs> um, tomorrow night, uh, Dr. Ruth will yeah, regale yeah. us with uh, <laughs> with stories, and uh, uh, maybe I, I can let you in on the secret. Apparently, there is sex after 50. <laughs> but we'll know the details tomorrow. Yeah. So we'll invite you back for tomorrow, and thanks very much for attending. And Do Dr. Sinclair will be signing books at the back. <laughs>